Welcome to this UNEP Plus debate on digital rights presented within the Citizens Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by UNEP Plus and Radio Latvia, a member of the UNEP Plus network. The debate can be followed live from the European Parliament on the UNEP Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens Corner. I'm Brian McGuire. Joining us today to discuss digital rights in Europe, Catherine Stiller, United Kingdom MEP and Vice Chair of the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection, Victor Negrescu, a Romanian MEP with the Socialists and Democrats, Mark Tarabella will also be joining us shortly, a Belgian MEP from Socialists, Sabine Verheyen, a centre-right MEP from Germany, and uh, Mina Andreva, a Deputy Chief Spokesperson of the European Commission in charge of the digital single market and Joe McNamee, Executive Director of European Digital Rights. We're also joined by students from UNET Plus Campus Radio Network, Janeta Kuzniewska from Poland and Hannah Hantula from the University of Tampere in Finland. Welcome to all of you. Okay. Sabine, let me start with you. Do we have any digital rights? I think we have any digital rights because uh, we, uh, we have these rights uh, coming out from the general human rights question. I think uh, digital rights are not different to those fundamental rights we have as human beings, but the human rights must be translated into the digital world. And I think that is the task we have to do now, to, to not to define new digital rights, but, but to define the human rights for the digital uh, surrounding. Catherine, you deal a lot with the consumer issues around this as well, yeah. uh, copyright for mm -hmm. example. What are the key issues for European citizens today when it comes to digital rights? I think. It trust is one aspect of that. I think that we've seen the Consumer Rights Directive and uh, it being applied also to online rights. We also um, know that uh, if we want the European economy to grow, we have to improve on our cross-border trade. And at the moment, that is very, very low. And that's a kind of disappointment about the single market. But if we can get trust, if we can get the other things in place, you talked to mentioned copyright, we touched upon data there. If we can get those things in place, then the digital single market can be a reality. And that is something that is good both for consumers, growth, and also for EU citizens in general. We have to see that uh, become a reality. And we've got five years to do that. In, and that's the key challenge, okay. I think, for this parliament. Mina, this is uh, one of the fundamental priorities for this commission's agenda in terms of uh, using the digital market to accelerate growth and to grow the economy. Yes, indeed. For the Juncker Commission, the digital single market is a top priority and Vice President ANSIP is coordinating the work there. We want to break down barriers that consumers are currently facing. We mentioned copyright and we want to create trust. Trust is a must and trust is bankable. If citizens have the trust that their data, for example, are well protected, that their rights are respected online as they are offline, then this is also good for businesses because today we see that only 12% of consumers shop cross-border when they shop online. So there is a huge potential that we could exploit here if we break down the barriers that we're currently still seeing. Do you think this uh, trust issue is what's limiting the cross-border activity? This is a huge part of the problem because basically 90% of the internet users say they are not using the internet to, uh, to shop uh, online because of security concerns. Mm -hmm. So obviously trust is an issue here. We have already tabled proposals, notably for example the data protection regulation in order to improve the trust, but there are still uh, things that need to be done, obviously notably in the copyright um, area. Okay, Joe, you only trust left when it comes to the digital economy? Yes. Um, I think the, the Commission has done a lot. I think if you look at the last 10 years, there have been lots of pieces of legislation that have been put in place that, uh, that do generate trust. The uh, Commission's proposal on data protection was a, a very important step. Um, when it comes to national implementation, a lot of the time, uh, there are issues and the previous Commission was um, politely, shall we say, reticent when it came to um, requiring member states to implement uh, uh, legislation. Um, I would agree very strongly with what um, Sabina said. It's about defining and the, our rights in the digital age and not um, reinventing uh, the rights framework. But it's also important to enforce that framework and that's something that, that needs a lot of work. Okay, Victor, how do you view this? Do you think that we have the tools in place now to make the digital economy work and to grow this trust in the digital age? Firstly, I have to mention that I represent a different generation. I represent the digital generation. I believe actually the Commission has to do still a lot of work in order to improve the conditions for this market to develop. 
I also developed a business in the digital sector and I faced uh, the problems and the difficulties of developing a business all over Europe. And I believe today the Commission doesn't give the rights, doesn't have the laws necessary to stimulate this type of industry. We need to do, to do more. These are the discussions that are taking place currently in, in, uh, in the European Parliament. We try to improve the legislation and I believe we should look at uh, the people using the digital, uh, the digital product, not only as users, not only as consumers, like the Commission seems to do, but to see people as digital citizens capable of doing a lot of things uh, using, using uh, the internet, using the facilities offered by the the digital world. Okay, as an entrepreneur, what do you see as the obstacles to uh, leveraging this digital command? First of all, it's the recognition in all member states of the different of the different legal mechanisms uh, in, uh, uh, introduced by the European Commission, but also existing in a lot of member states. The problem is that it's very difficult to go from one market to another. Currently, we don't have a legislation, we don't have the facilities and the procedure improving the uh, improving a common market in the digital sector. We, okay. we have a lot of barriers existing. Okay, just before we take a question from one of our students, we'll come back to Mina with this as well. Mm -hmm. Mina, this is all about the single market at the end of it. This is the whole raison d'etre for, for the European uh, project, primarily. What, uh, what's holding us back? Why is it so complicated to get uh, a harmonized market when it comes to digital issues? Well, I think we already laid the first steps with our, as we explained, the data protection regulation, but also with consumer rights um, directive and uh, what we're doing in the area of contract law. I think it's very important what Victor mentioned that for SMEs it costs uh, at least at least a two thousand euro per other market to adapt at least only the contract and the website in order to do um, business cross border. So therefore, we need to uh, break down barriers and have a more harmonized approach uh, with regards to consumer rules with regards to contract law with regards to data protection so that they don't have these huge transaction costs but also apart from breaking down regulatory barriers we also have to enable investment and there the investment plan of the Juncker Commission also uh, uh, co uh, contributes to SMEs, they can benefit if they have viable project in the area of digital notably, they can apply um, and uh, get funding from the European Strategic Fund for Investments. So there I think on the one side breaking down barriers but on the other hand also making sure that SMEs can thrive through investments. The next Google should be European. Okay, Jeanette, you have a question for the panel? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm also the representative of digital, uh, digital uh, society. But I'll, uh, I have the questions uh, according to data protection. Uh, you have spoken about that. Uh, I've uh, chosen that, uh, I've, I've noticed that 77% uh, of Europeans uh, have the access uh, to the internet, but only 12% percent feel safe uh, feel safe when uh, when ma while making i don't know payments and so on online how let to how to let me bring this yeah. to Catherine first of all Catherine I think last time we spoke we spoke about your mom on the internet as well <laughs> <laughs> I think your mom might be She's one loving of it <laughs> by the way she does <laughs> Hi the Catherine's mom uh, this is this is something particularly for an older generation as well how do we convince this additional 12% or will we ever convince them is this something we just need to move on from no, I think I think you will. I think that 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 you know everything is digital. The digital single market is a separate, separate se single market. It is the single market, but what we have to do in terms of moving to the next step to make it truly a single market across the European Union. I mean, you touched upon it. You know, here we are at a time where we need single set of rules across 28 countries at a time where people are becoming more resistant to us taking any action at all. And this is the thing that we have to do as politicians, I think, is to convince people that the work that we're doing in the digital single market is to not just only make their lives easier, it's also about jobs and it's about growth and it's about actually making Europe work. And I think that's what the exciting moment that we're at. And uh, yeah, let's encourage people like my mum to keep shopping online because she likes it, she finds it convenient. And that's important to people to have that choice and to be safe in that choice. Okay, Victor, Mina mentioned uh, about the next Google coming from Europe. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that. Um, personally, I believe the next Google uh, already exists in Europe, but uh, we need to, to create the mechanisms to help it uh, develop. Because currently what we are facing is the competition coming in this sector from different parts of the world and we aren't prepared to face it. We have uh, barriers, we have mechanisms that 
uh, basically stop the appearance of this type of company. And this starts from what my colleague mentioned, a mistrust, a lack of information. This is where we need to work more because we need to inform not only the citizens but only the national administrations because this is where we are facing the most difficulties is to influence the civil servants in every member state to actually accommodate to the legislations that we are doing at the level of the European Parliament and European Commission because they are opposing to everything that comes from us because they don't understand. They don't have, have, have the information. This, this is where we need to work more and we need the Commission to work with us. Catherine seems a little sceptical about influencing no, no, all civil I, servants across I, I Europe. I think we're only as strong as our constituent parts. We're only okay. as strong as the 28 member states. That's really what you're saying. And I think, you know, we have to work together to make this happen. And, and uh, you know, and if we do, the, 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 the prize at the end of it is about a more successful Europe and people, um, ha you know, jobs and growth okay. are at the centre of that. Let's change tack a little bit and talk about the, the trust element in the context of, of surveillance as well. Joe, do you think that a lot of this mistrust doesn't actually come from problems doing internet trade, but the mistrust comes from our perception of how government and how large corporations use our data? Well, the problem is that most of the time we don't know, and when we do know, um, it's impossible to actually enforce the rights. Uh, if you look at um, Facebook, for example, the amount of data that is processed by that company, um, they're data processing is registered in Ireland, which has got a um, remarkably weak implementation um, of the, the directive, um, where it's extremely difficult to persuade the small, under-resourced, living on top of a, a shop in the middle of nowhere data protection authority to, to do something about it. And the, the previous commission made a very ambitious um, step in trying to address these issues. Um, and what has happened has been the, the lobbying campaign of all lobbying campaigns, and Sabine has suffered more than, than most, I think, with that. And what we now have is a text that was um, improved in a lot of areas, but weakened in key, er key areas in the, the Parliament, and is now in a, a dreadful state in, in the Commission, and the Council, rather. And what the Member States are doing is um, putting national derogations into it left, right and centre. And you, you've, got, you, you've got the worst of all possible worlds. You've got a, a mix of a, of a okay. regulation with, uh, with the directive with no coherence. And coming back to the points that were made a moment ago, um, there has to be European leadership from in the EU level, but the member states have to believe in it and they have to take a step back okay. and say there are priorities. Sabine, how do we convince member states to work with the leadership at, the, uh, at, at this level in Brussels? I think what we, what we have to show to the member states is that it is uh, crucial to have a unified regulation or directive on these, on these, uh, a regulation on these issues because one single member state is not able to ensure data protection by himself, uh, by itself in the in the digital world. We are, that that is a cross-border world. You see it in the services, uh, searching out the the weakest uh, implem implemented area uh, for for the data protection uh, uh, directive, and and I think that is the big problem we have at the moment. That um, some member states do not understand that they just have a chance to implement these basic rules uh, just if we work together. And um, I hope that uh, with arguments also from, from, from each member of the European Parliament dealing and discussing with uh, members from the national parliaments that we get another uh, uh, situation in the Council and that we come to a conclusion that is sufficient for, for the needs we have in the data protection. Okay. I mean, Jean-Claude Juncker said the, this commission is not going to be the secretariat of the Council. Is he going to play hardball and get these things done? I think the Commission is defending uh, the community method already in the data protection regulations, uh, in the data protection negotiations, and I think a wind of change is actually blowing. I mean, notably in Germany, when you hear the Chancellor now speaking, it's all digital. Digital is everywhere, and I think by uh, name already, a regulation means that you cannot have exceptions and loopholes any everywhere, even if member states try. But of course, you have to differentiate between the public sector, so what the state does um, in order to protect its citizens, and 
the private sector, what the private sector can do with the data of citizens. So I think some uh, nuanced distinction within the negotiations um, is justified, but the Commission is defending, the community method is defending that this should be a regulation in order to ensure maximum harmonization in the interests of consumers and businesses. Okay, Janetta? Yes, it's very hard to convince the people and normal citizens to uh, trust uh, e-government uh, things, as, uh, as you said. Uh, it's a lot of work to do because 50% of uh, European citizens use uh, e-government, but what another 50 do? Okay. Catherine, this morning, uh, John Sawyer, former head of MI6, he said, people have to accept, we have to spy on innocent people to uh, catch those who aren't so innocent, and people just have to live with this. And our framework, a legal framework, isn't at that point yet. Do you agree with that? I think it's an interesting perspective. I think that obviously you have to balance our own privacy issues, and we've seen why the debate on data has become so contentious in some respects. But the other side of that is that we do come from different cultures. I quite like using my club card when I shop and different things, and I I, I freely give my data so that I can be given offers when I go to the supermarket and that's my right to do that and it's how we get this balance right of privacy but also making sure that you know some of the data that can be used is very very important in terms of planning and public services and you touched upon something about public services and about e-government which I just want to just briefly briefly mention and that is e-voting. I really feel that we should be being much more progressive in how we uh, vote and, 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 and voting electronically is something that I think we have to definitely explore, in particular as we move to new European elections in 2019 and perhaps in 2024, that might be the goal of having e-voting in European elections. If you can do it in Estonia and you can do it in Latvia, why can we not do that in other countries and why is it so difficult to be able to do that? And I think that's something I, I really think if you want to include people and in expand the franchise of voting and our democracy, we have to get e-voting right. Okay, Hannah's got a question for us also. Hannah. Yes, um, about the equality issues uh, with the e-government. Um, the percentage of uh, EU citizens with an access to the internet varies greatly um, inside the Union. In Romania, that's about 40%. In Sweden, 90%. Mm. Um, how great a problem do you think this is concerning equality? Okay, Mina. Huge yeah, Mina. What the targets are pretty clear. We know where we have to get with this. The funding just doesn't seem to be there for it right now. How are we going to leverage that? Well, the target is indeed broadband for all, yeah. all over Europe, yeah. Yeah. and uh, that is why one of the priorities under the investment plan of, the, of President Juncker is to finance digital infrastructure so that we all That's get right. connected, that we roll out uh, fast broadband internet, um, and that we get people connected. And Vice President Ansip, who comes from Estonia, from the digital continent, he brings hi huge experience with him in this area, and I think this is one of the reasons why President Juncker trusted him with this portfolio, so uh, he can also play a very constructive role and bring in his experience, as yeah. you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Victor, how important is this connectivity? What, what does it mean in, in practical terms when the whole of Europe is digitally connected? Yeah, I, need, I needed to react because uh, your colleague mentioned Romania. <laughs> uh, Romania has only 40% uh, having access to internet, but has one of the, the fastest internet connection in Europe. So we have to take into consideration all sides of the story. Personally, I believe we look too much at percentage. We don't look at, uh, at what we need to do in order to convince people. For instance, even in Romania, there is a huge debate about electronic voting. People are supporting it, even though only 40% have access to, to internet. So we need to, to uh, talk about all of these things. So uh, sometimes us as politicians, we need to explain better, not only look at polls. Polls are good, but they don't explain everything. And uh, you discussed also about, about surveillance. There is also a debate in, in a lot of European countries. We discuss so much about Big Brother, Big Brother coming from the United States, imposing to the EU member states to survey, uh, to, 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 to try to, 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 uh, to verify everyone and so, uh, so forward. I believe we should also pay attention to, to this debate because I come from a former communist country and sometimes too much information given to the state it, uh, it's uh, it's very it's very difficult to, okay. to, to to keep to keep the protection of the individual in these cases. Okay, this digital chill, this freedom of expression. More than 70 people have been arrested in France for saying things which uh, were impolite, to say the least. But this is, seems to go against their freedom of expression as well. Joe, at which level do we use 
data surveillance and uh, how do we redress imbalances and excesses uh, when it's not used correctly? Well, at the moment, we're just so far away from, from where we need to be. Um, we need to um, hold uh, the forces of the state to account when we see that they're, they're, uh, they're breaking the law. It's very difficult to have trust in, uh, in many security agencies when, when we see the abuses that, that are happening. And uh, the history of the European Data, Data Retention Directive is an example of, um, of how sceptical a citizen um, will be and, and why. Um, the legislation was proposed in 2005-2006. Um, it was um, done on a uh, legal basis that was patently incorrect. It was retaining data for policing purposes and it was called a single okay. market instrument. Um, everyone involved knew that it was not in line with uh, the European legal framework. It was pushed is through... Is this, this kind of thing uh, being repeated with TTIP as well? Well, TTIP is, is somewhat different as, as trade rather than, um, rather than uh, security. But the, the point with the Data Retention Directive was that it was, it was uh, implemented, it was pushed through by the UK presidency using the London terror attacks. Um, with everyone conscious of the fact that it wasn't in line okay. with the legal framework, it took seven years uh, in order to, to get that okay. repealed. And the Commission is already talking about proposing a new data retention directive. Sabine, so, you spoke about the fundamental rights, the human rights. Is this the moment where, rather than populism, which is so easy to, to do, that we have to have a balanced approach and we have to have clear fundamental rights for what, what it means to have digital privacy and the digital personality? I think uh, that are two sides of the of the same medal. On the one on the one side, you have the right of protection your pers of the protection of your personal data. On the other hand, there is a common interest in in, in living in, in in safety and to, to be secured. But I think um, the to find the right balance um, between this must be um, defined to. Uh, the interest and to the first uh, impression you have, is that a person that might uh, be difficult? Not, not everything should be in general uh, stored for a long time. And I think that was the, the problem with the, with the data retention directive, uh, that the, the, the general order to do it uh, uh, was, 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 was not in but the security correct services in the implementation. Now are saying, you know, this, we could have done more with these attacks. We could have known more, but the instruments there weren't, yeah. weren't there for us to do. So, Mean. Well, I think to start with, in France, they do have uh, data retention and nevertheless the attacks happen. So I think there is no such thing as 100% security, not even in prison. Um, but I think striking the right balance as an example to um, what the Commission has been doing wh with regards to harmful content online, our approach has always been don't block the internet, but work on swift procedures with internet providers to take illegal or harmful content down whenever there is, um, there is a problem. Because the internet um, is an, it should be an open means and we should never put in question this openness and universal, universality of the internet. Okay. So this is an example of how we're trying to strike the right balance. Okay, me and I will come to Victor in just a second. Google's having a tough time here at the moment as well, particularly with a couple of our, our own MEPs, where the issue that it seems to be Europe isn't digitally friendly, that people who have invested so much and contributed so much in terms of society are now seeing their progress blocked because it's seen as anti-competitive and because of digital trust issues as well. How are you going to square some of these uh, issues uh, to make the way for the digital market to be a, an investor happy place? Exactly. The digital market is about fair competition, equal rules and equal access for all. So what the Commission does as the guardian of the treaties is making sure that companies are not being discriminated against and that they have a fair access to the gold mine, uh, uh, our single market that hosts 507 million potential uh, consumers. So this is our aim and there we are playing our role. This has nothing to do with targeting certain companies, but everyone has to play by the rules if they want to play on our market. Okay, Victor, this, uh, the, the trust issue in terms of, of large corporations, the Googles as well, are we seeing a pushback from Europe which is going to be anti-competitive uh, when it comes down to getting funding for our own companies? Personally, I believe we shouldn't stop uh, this company to access the European mar market, but of course we need to improve the regulation in order to ensure a fair competition. Even, unfortunately, in Europe we have this uh, 
these possibilities of some companies to go from one country to another and to take advantage of some on some uh, tax regulations that uh, facilitate the development of that company. For instance, we have Amazon that went to Luxembourg and developed its company there because they have lower taxes on online uh, books. So uh, we have this problem of fairness within the EU. We need to regulate that firstly and after that try to, to discuss with our foreign partners about a better international regulation. I believe something that is very important for companies but also for people is the presum presumption of innocence. Digital consumers, digital companies need to have this presumption of innocence before trying to attack them directly. So we should discuss more with them. Catherine, should, it's an interesting point, and we keep in track with the fundamental rights as well. Should we continue to have a presumption of innocence when it comes to the digital age? Or is everybody assumed to be guilty of something, but it's only a matter of can we get them prosecuted for it? And the corporate side as well as the personal side. I think, I think that uh, you have to have rules, and those rules should be, and that this is the, the problem where we have the digital, we want the digital single market, but the rules are not clear, and that's where problems arise. I think one of the things we're missing, actually, in the debate so far has been actually touching upon the skills agenda as well because I do think that uh, certainly trying to bring um, the issue of coding into schools trying to look at how we can ensure that people are better skilled to enjoy what is there in the digital single market in the future as well as currently and I think that if we can again look I think much more um, cooperatively cross issues, whether it's the, the issue which you've touched upon in terms of the data and the privacy to issues around the skills agenda, to issues around um, what we've been doing in uh, copyright, consumer rights, all of these things actually work together. And this is, this is the trick, isn't it? The, the complexity of what the digital single market is, 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 is something that we have to just get right. And it is complex, it's difficult, it's hard, but the goal at the end of that is if we can do that, it will, you know, it will, it will transform Europe. And actually, you know, we have a citizenship of 500, we've got a single market of 500 million people. That's larger than the American single market. We're in a global world and the globalization agenda as well about how not just our companies trading cross-border, our companies trading globally and how we make sure in particular our SMEs take great benefit from that because that is the drivers for growth in the okay. European economy. Mina, during the presidential election campaign, John claude Juncker was pictured riding with a feather and uh, declaring that you didn't really have to get all this to, to know what needed to be done. Is his legacy at the end of this, is it likely to be that he created the framework, this commission created the framework for the next generation? We, the European Commission promoted Coding Week, for example, and it's aimed at the younger generation as well. Is, are you comfortable that you're not going to achieve everything that you've set as your targets, but that you can lay the foundation for the next generation? Well, coding is cool, and uh, <laughs> President Juncker is our digital president. I would love I'm to see sure him coding. <laughs> well, you see him tweeting, certainly. He's very I'm not sure it's on the other <laughs> But um, jokes apart, I think that uh, clearly he is very serious about uh, his agenda and the, the agenda of this commission, and he will want to be remembered for laying the groundwork for completing the digital single market. I mean, a lot has been done already, as we discussed, but more remains to be done, and I think he will be satisfied once consumers can really download across borders, can watch a movie across mm. border, um, so they're no longer frustrated when they click and get, okay. sorry, no access yeah. to that. Okay, Jeanette, this is key to it, isn't it? The, the more people use, the more comfortable, more familiar they become with it, the more transactions occur. Yes, of course, uh, it really matters. But I have also a short commentary to the words of uh, Ms. Stiller, uh, who told us that... Uh, e-government and e-elections will be something positive. Yes, it, would, it will be something positive uh, because it enables uh, some disab uh, disabled people to take part uh, in a comfortable way to the uh, elections. Uh, but also there are a lot of things to do. But I think uh, that it will influence positively uh, to the frequency, for example. Okay, Catherine, are you really comfortable with all that we know about surveillance today, going into a polling booth, putting your fingerprint on a digital scanner and clicking a button to show who you voted for. 
Hang on, you just said going into a polling booth. And, and oh, sorry. Uh, well, the thing about... I can't imagine they're going to do away with them. I mean, the, the, the thing about the idea about digital voting and e-governance and all of these types of issues is that already in several member states of the European Union, people can vote online. So you can be, you know, anywhere and you can do that. In my country, even registering oh, until recently for a postal vote was problematic. And this is not helping our franchise or where people are at. And I think that if we do not start to look at how and test the models that work in other countries in the European Union at the moment about e-voting and making sure that we are trying to pursue that agenda for the future, I think this is something that we really need to get real about and it's something that will enhance citizens' activity. And let's look at, I mean, the European elections. How many people turned out to vote in the European elections? I think that if you had e-voting, it's certainly a, a, you know, something across the European Union, it's something that could be accessible and open to improve our franchise and get people voting. I think that's something that we really should embrace. Okay, a question here online from Anika. Uh, Joe, you can have this. Can we create a European collective action? Uh, it would be very useful against multinational companies such as Google. There's a lot in that question, I think. Um, well, yes and no. Um, there is nothing per se preventing this from happening. Um, when it arrived in this house, um, what um, the businesses that uh, spend a lot of time here would uh, persuade the parliamentarians to do um, is uh, possibly another question. But yes, particularly uh, if you look at um, privacy rights, for example, there, are, um, there is a very clear need to have a, a collective action so that um, expert organizations can, can, take, uh, can take court cases and, and, uh, and have redress for, for citizens. If I could just mention briefly on e-voting, e-voting is vastly more complicated than, uh, than it sounds, um, and I can, I can bring a team of people to explain the difficulties please, with the Estonian, <laughs> the Estonian e-voting system. We don't want difficulties, we don't <laughs> yeah, want difficulties, yeah, we want yeah. to see where we can but, make change. Um, but it, it, it shouldn't be, I mean, if you, if you look at the history of e-voting in Ireland, which was a monumental, uh, very expensive catastrophe, um, the uh, technical questions that are being raised about the Estonian e-voting system, you really need to be reticent and very, very careful. Uh, it's, not some, it's not something that you can flick a switch and you have perfect e-voting. Okay. I'm not saying that that's no, what you said. No, but it's something we do need, do you not agree? It's, not, it's something we need to explore. We need to explore that if we don't, we'll be left behind and it won't be till, what, 2029 that you might even get three countries e-vote. I mean, this is the thing. If you want European elections to be more opened up, I think that e-voting has to be something that we explore. I'm not, I'm, I agree there are diff absolute okay. difficulties, but so we me. have to be in that space. But I think if, if you think that just uh, the e-voting will rise up the number of voters, I think the, the way we, we, we talk about our policies, the transparency we have here, I think that will be the clue for getting more people voting. I think we have many also other systems that help people, also disabled people, to take part in a vote. Uh, it's the postal thing, uh, it's uh, 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 being, being uh, um, accompanied by others. Uh, there are many things and, and it all, that also doesn't help really rising up the numbers. But I think uh, you are absolutely right we that have you have to it. test. We have to but but you it. also have to take into account what Joe uh, said, that you have to be careful not just see the positive things, but also think about the complications that can be there, about the costs, about these things and knowing this you can go the step forward but not just running and afterwards seeing oh it doesn't work. I, I never well. suggested okay. that what I do think is that we shouldn't uh, be talking about the digital single market without talking about all the other aspects that we need to address and I think that e-voting is something that we certainly should be exploring. We've got an Estonian who is in charge of the digital single market and this is something I think that we is a great advantage to us but also the expertise in that particular okay. area. The, the concept of what data is is an issue as well. It, I think it was Ryan Heath actually who spoke last year and he, he said you pay with something, you pay with money or you pay with data. Is our perception of what hmm. data is, should it change so that in terms of rights as well. We know what happens. If you take my money and you shouldn't, you know what happens. And if you misuse it as a stock worker or something like that, you know what's going to happen. But with data, it's, it's more opaque. And yet the data perhaps has more intrinsic value at certain points than the cash itself. Victor, do we have a branding issue when it comes to uh, our, our digital perception of, of data and money and rights? Yeah, I believe data protection is a big issue, a big issue because people don't know who keeps the data, how it is being used. Uh, I know it's a huge difficulty in Europe. Citizens are a little bit afraid of giving their data. Uh, in my opinion, as former entrepreneur in this field, data value a lot more than money 
for a lot of companies. There are companies specialized in selling data, in keeping it, in, in managing it, so we, we should take a look at that. But I also want to refer to the discussions that took place before. We don't have a perfect voting now, so online voting uh, comes with the same problems. What I, I can give you the example for, uh, for Romania. We have six million Romanians living abroad only 200,000 vote because they don't have the possibility. I would like the 6 million to have the possibility to vote and online voting can, can make them vote. Okay, Sabine, the, let's go back to fundamental rights again. How do we police this? How do we police our digital rights? Um, first of all, we, we have to, to work on it uh, on, the, on the legislative level. Uh, that's the first step we have to do. We have to make regulations, we have to make directives. Um, and I think uh, in the digital rights, we have to work stronger with uh, regulations and not as much with directive because you always are cross-border. And all differences you have between the different member states in implementing a, rec uh, a directive uh, makes it difficult, again, for the digital single market to work correctly. I think that is not just the problem for the digital single market, but also for, for the single market in general that we have so many exemptions and, 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 and uh, uh, situations where you have different law that makes it difficult. Um, it starts if you if you come to to to, to business if you sell a product um, and you see the different uh, rights and the different situations in delivering this product cross border uh, that leads to to being not able for example as a German person to order something in Great Britain that is sent to the European Union it's a it's a question uh, to to the to the to the continent it's always very difficult also today not just for the digital area but but we always have to to bring into account this interlinkage between the analog and the digital world. And I think that's the big problem we have to, to face in our legislation and in this legislation we have to do here and to, uh, in the implementing acts we have in the, in the member states, we will have to find the right, uh, the right balance also to include these uh, general rights we have, consumers' rights, uh, right to access, right to, to information uh, and also the human okay. right facts. Mina, how do we incentivize harmonization more quickly? This, this is going to take forever if we have to go through council every time and get everything negotiated. And it's never going to be of sufficient quality to really advance the digital market at a good pace. How do we incentivize? Well, I think if you look at the last data protection directive that was from 95, it took at least seven years to negotiate it. So I think we're already quite good with the data protection regulation that's been on the table now for over two years. But we are getting there. I mean, we're confident that's going to be adopted this year. Of course, this is the European Union. You make decisions by consensus and you need to have everyone on board to strike the right balance. But I think in comparison to what we've seen in the past, we are moving already much quicker because uh, member states, but also parliamentarians, everyone is realizing that we cannot afford to be always lagging behind uh, digital and technological developments. That's also why we have proposed a data protection regulation that sets in place the principles and that is technology neutral. So whatever technology you apply, the same rules uh, would apply and that makes it easier to keep up with technological developments. I think we have a window of opportunity right now. The wind of change is blowing um, and uh, everyone is interested in putting in place solid digital rights, acro uh, rights across the European continent. Okay, Catherine, do you think it's going to be a security agenda which actually drives harmonization in the sense that it's the security agencies which are saying we need this interoperability across borders and cyber terrorists of any sort are not going to stop there and, and, and behind that comes a level of, of uh, platform which works th for everything else. I think from the discussion just now, I think that that's one aspect of it, but we already have online rights uh, coming from the Consumer Rights Directive that basically our citizens really don't know much about. And that's up to member states also to translate that and inform citizens about what the rights are existing at the moment. So on one level, we've got certain existing rights. On the other level, we've, we're trying to ensure whether it's through data, the new copyright rules, whether it's uh, the stuff that I'm working on in, in intellectual property rights, all of these things which actually coming together will make the digital single market as a whole work effectively. Okay. So it's a, a balance of both. Okay, uh, Sven online on uh, Facebook uh, has a question. So what kind of rights can I have if all my data in Facebook isn't owned by me? Joe. Um, well, um, the right you have is to uh, to go to a little town called Port Arlington, uh, which is uh, not very far away from Dublin, uh, and uh, climb the stairs uh, to above a shop and talk to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, who will tell you that there's not much that they can do and uh, 
the, they're restrained anyway by the Safe Harbor Agreement, um, which the European Commission has entered into for the last uh, 15, 17 years. Um, okay. And, and which the European Commission recognizes pretty much as being illegal, but it, is, it hasn't had the courage yet to, uh, to uh, have, have our digital bring rights become uh, corporate? I don't think it's, it's that simple. But if I could mention one, th there's one crucial thing that we managed to not talk about at all um, in, in talking about the digital single market, and that is the telecommunications single market regulation, mm -hmm. which is currently going through. Um, as drafted by the Commission, um, this would allow uh, telecoms companies to create barriers um, to content uh, online at the same time as the Commission is, is removing uh, regulatory barriers online. And even more strangely, um, bearing in mind what okay. Mina said about blocking of content, it explicitly gives a, a right to internet providers to interfere with traffic for voluntary law enforcement purposes in explicit contradiction to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. I mean, is that correct? No, sorry. I mean, net neutrality and keeping the same uh, quality for the internet, that is something that is inscribed in the telecoms package. Of course, service providers should nevertheless be able to offer different products, like your post office can offer you a quick delivery, for example, versus uh, a less, uh, uh, a slower delivery, if you pay for the different services. So I think it's, it's not correct here to say that we're creating additional barriers, if this okay. is what you're referring to. But I also have to refute uh, the allegation here that the safe harbor is illegal. I think we've recognized that the safe harbor is not safe and that is why we're working on improving it and we're already seeing improvements, uh, notably with ac access to justice from consumers um, and I think that needs to be recognized, the work of the Commission in, in this okay. area. A quick comment from Sabine before we close. I think the example with the, with the, with the letter uh, uh, and the different post services is not correct because if I want to send a letter fast, it doesn't matter which content this letter will have. It just matters uh, that I paid for the for a fast line. But what was planned with the, or is planned with specialized services, is that special content is faster than other things if you have a contract. And that goes a step further. And I think there we have to be very careful. Um, uh, the, the way we did it in the European Parliament gives the chance to do these things, but this should not harm the open internet access with absolutely equal treatment well, or, uh, let's okay. say, uh, the, 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 the flow coming, of, of, of we're data. We're coming to the end of the program. Line. Catherine, last word on this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you remember this. So the, is this going to be led in the end by consumer preferences? My hope it will be. I hope that people will demand the things we want to see out of the digital single market, which is which is to have it working effectively. In the moment, it's not working effectively. We need new rules. We need to work together. And let's hope in the next five years we can see some achievements in that area. Okay, we're going to do a quick summary of what we discussed today. In essence, it's a matter of trust and balance. Uh, we've been dealing with the fundamental rights and perhaps the emergence of something which could approximate a, a fundamental human right as well. The trust begins at the consumer level, we're dealing with cross-border trade, and as a top priority, the Commission uh, is dealing with this as part of its investment plan as well. The digital generation, the single market, especially SMEs, have a lot to contribute and a lot to benefit from uh, the next five years here as well. And the next Google, will it come from Europe? Uh, Victor Negrescu thinks it's already uh, in the pipeline. And the lack of information, we need to educate to our citizens about their rights and also how to use them to, to leverage uh, our economy as well to achieve a greater integration uh, which can lead to export as well. And the, the, the situation that we face today with security, with surveillance, will we have to give up more? Probably we will, but will we learn to deal with uh, this in a more mature way as we understand the issues better? Education for the public, uh, better control at government level and a police level as well and a more open economy. Let me just thank our guests today, Catherine Steeler, uh, Victor Negres, uh, Sabine Verheyen, Mina Andreeva, uh, Joe McNamee, and uh, Jeanette Czesneska, and Hannah Hantula. Thank you also very much for your contribution today. This has been a Citizens Corner with Euronet Plus and Radio Lab.